Welcome to the Secret Sauce of Selling Podcast, the ultimate guide and sales gym to unlocking the secrets of successful selling. I'm your host, James Abraham, and I'm excited to be here with you today to share insights, tactics, strategies, and behaviors, attitudes, and techniques to help you take your sales performance and sales leadership game to the next level. Now, I've got a super great guest for us today. I've got Joe Styles from the Center Network, from the Center Enterprise bench, actually. Joe, welcome to the show. Uh, thanks. Good to be here, James. Really good to uh, good to be here. And uh, Joe's a veteran in sales and, and, and a longtime sander. He was involved in the network, and uh, now he's involved in, in complex enterprise, uh, the complex enterprise selling world. And and so, Joe, uh, why don't you give us a, a sixty second uh, introduction of who you are and uh, how you got to where you are today? Um, well, interesting story. I uh, <laughs> way back when I got into Sandler because I came out of a role as a manager and a leader and and into another one discovered that I just really didn't know how to sell. And uh, that's when I met Ed Staub and the Sandler Network. And the rest is kind of history. I, I moved to North Carolina, got involved with the Sandler uh, Network, and I've been a part of Sandler ever since. <clears throat> and it's been, awesome. it's been, it's been a blast. Mm -hmm. It's great. And so today's topic, uh, we wanted to talk, we talked a little bit before the recording. Um, and we, we talked a lot about, uh, about, sellers understanding their craft, understanding what they really do. So uh, let's unpack that. Why don't you tell me what is your take about understanding the craft of professional selling, why that's important? I, I think that there's a complexity to selling. I think there's a complexity to our world, to advancing an idea through an organization. And um, while I, I keep running into lots of people who are experts in their field, they understand what they do from you know a product standpoint, that whole relationship aspect is uh, another craft and, and understanding how to um, use that relationship and enter into that relationship as a craft in and of itself. And that's the, the craft that I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. So that's interesting. A lot of times I get all these questions, is sales and art, is it a science? Uh, what does it really mean? What is that profession piece? Uh, and, and, I, and I like to ask, what, what does it take to be a salesperson? Ooh, that's a, that's a, and, and again, I, yeah, I mean, it's probably the easiest job to get, mm -hmm. but I think I it's mean, the first job to keep. Ooh. And I think that when you think about it, you have to be, you have to have expertise, some level of expertise in, in your company. Um, you have to pay attention to your competitors. You've got to be, you have to understand the position in the market. You have to pay attention to industry in the marketplace. Then you have to understand this whole communication psychology piece and what your customers and prospects are going through. I mean, there are a lot of moving parts to it. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think that a lot of my history in companies is they look at these sales teams and they, they're not quite sure what they do, but they know they drive revenue for the organization. But so there's, there's probably some internal conflicts as well. So, so, so that's very, interesting. Let's, let's, let's pretend you could give leadership a peek into what's really happening and what should happen, what would they see if, if through your eyes? Through my eyes, I think that, um, you know, that, uh, yeah, oh, wow, <laughs> tough. I, I, I think respect the complexity of the profession is, 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 what, is what I came up with. Everybody wants an easy fix. But today, um, just building up a pipeline for a new territory takes months because of how many touches and you know opening up those doors i mean what what are those numbers up to like something like 18 in order just to have a conversation with somebody touch point yeah i heard something of that something higher and in whatever that number is it's 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 certainly going in 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 a different direction so there's an enormous amount of time just spent just getting in front of folks and then you know maximizing those opportunities as well um tough 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 question, James. Like, what would I want leadership to see? I want them to understand their sales teams is what I want. Yeah. Okay. Well, you know, and, and it's interesting. And you mentioned that 18 touch points. Um, mm -hmm. I think what I would like them to see from my perspective is, and I see this all the time, they're, they're basically entrusting a, a bunch of people um, with dealing with a lot of noise. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of noise, right? And like, oh, there's, everyone's making lots of noise to the prospects. Let's try and make some more noise. And the one who makes the most noise, maybe, maybe we'll be able to book an appointment. And maybe we'll have another appointment. And maybe, and when there's just more noise going on. So how do we navigate that noise? How do we clear the noise 
from your perspective, what, what, what should leaders, if they could envision a clean, professional, crafty sales approach, what, what would it look like with regards to building that relationship, getting through and having buyers and prospects um, lower their guard and, and, well, and talk about the issues? I, th- I think number one, um, you know, understand the playing field understand, you know, there's, there's been an enormous amount of research on how buyers buy and we're trending as salespeople in the wrong direction. Um, you know, buying, buying processes have gotten more complex. There are more check-ins. I think it's more of an internal influence play than it is this straight line, one person making a decision. I mean, there are some cases like that in in some areas, but there's a lot of, um, discussion going on. And, The other part of it is that they want less prospects in general are spending less time with salespeople. Mm -hmm. Nobody's asking the question, am I bringing value? Um, And going back to your comment about making the most most noise, making the most noise doesn't bring value. And the our, our, our world, I've seen our world change over the last 20 years. Our prospects, our customers have access to just about any piece of information they'd like to get their hands on. And I asked the question, why are we showing up regurgitating that same information um, and not recognizing the fact that our prospects haven't learned to ask different questions? And when I go back to that leadership, it's why don't you have a framework for changing the nature of the conversation? Why don't you have a framework and a and a path that leads us to that partner heading towards that rare trusted advisor? And 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 those are some things that I would wish leaders would understand. Oh, and by the way, we're all under this pressure of monthly, quarterly, yearly numbers. So there's there's that aspect of it as well. And I'm not saying get rid of that, but how do we move in that in a meaningful way? And so is that because they're afraid? They don't know. They feel that they just throw people at a problem and it'll go away. Um, What what's? Yeah, I I I don't want to get in the in into the minds. I think that. you know, when we look at this thing called a professional relationship, um, I, I, I think that I, when I ask questions around that, what is a professional relationship? I, I get some blank stares. I get some people that say, well, I really haven't thought about that. And I think to your point, again, making the most noise or showing up, we, we have this sense that if we do everything the prospect tells us to do, even if it's not in the prospect's best interest, then the prospect will like us. It's, I'm going to do what you say and hope for a better outcome. And that's not being a professional. That's not coming in and helping somebody look at uh, a solution in a different way. That's not somebody coming in and really deeply diagnosing uh, a challenge, a problem, a gap that needs to be solved and the ramifications around those gaps. So there, there's, there's this idea that information is going to change the nature or change somebody's mind, but that's not the case at all. All of these decisions at some level are emotional. I got I to gotta ask you, you've been doing this for so long and you've seen everything and uh, especially working with uh, an enterprise level, which part do you believe? And, and I know this is a tough question and I'm probably going to say, well, all three of them, but if I were to ask you, what do you believe is most important for today's sellers to master from a craft perspective? Is it the building relationship, communication part, qualification part or the closing part? I, I, I don't think you can effectively qualify or close if you haven't spent some time with a relationship. Now, I'm, I'm talking about a, you know, a complex sale. Uh, I mean, there are transactions that happen all the time. But even in those transactions, the organization has developed a relationship with the prospect, even if the, the salesperson hasn't um, in today's world, definitely. But, but I think it is, it is definitely building that relationship that would provide for the foundation of all of those and even helping us get into other organizations by leveraging that relationship down the line. And, and what do you believe? Um, so let's unpack that for a second because that's super interesting. What do you believe sales professionals need today? So what does their craft need to, need to be to, or what does it look like in order for them to be successful at building the relationship because I mean everyone's trying to build a relationship and uh, I have this um, I have this notion of I find sales professionals are you know they have a choice they can either be curious or needy um, we're, we're born uh, and you know we're born little scientists we're babies and we're constantly observing our surroundings we're constantly being curious we're curious 
creatures, humans. And, and we're curious. And at some point at childhood, we stop. Some people continue being more curious, but some people, instead of being curious, become needy. And I think my question to you is, how can professional sellers, especially in complex sales, um, start to control that, that, that fork in the road, that, that wimp junction, if you may, in order to, uh, to maintain uh, equal business stature, uh, stronger and better relationships, um, and most importantly, bring them to the point where they can then tee off towards qualifying and, and, and closing more effectively? Well, I think, I think you said it. Uh, when you mentioned the phrase equal business sat- stature, I mean, it's at Sandler, we have this phrase that we we it's, it's a starting point. It's a position. It's it's this sense of equal business stature. <clears throat> and I don't think that's something some some people innately have it. Uh, a very few, a small percentage of the population has this sense that I've got equal business stature. The rest of us grew up in a world where our stature was incredibly unequal. And I think we learned that when we approach somebody who we perceive as being an authority, that we cede that business stature to them and just do what they say. I think that's a learned behavior. So if we if we go back to this professional relationship, one of the most important things is the position that we have a right to professionally assert ourselves in an appropriate way. And we have a right to ask difficult questions. Um, and you know, how we get there is, is through various techniques, but, but I think that that's, that position right there is, is, is very important. If, and if we look at organizations and, and, and companies we're helping, and what we're talking about is, is they're adopting a new idea and they have a process that they go through and adopting it. And we've got to influence that. We can't influence that if they don't know the new idea and where they're going. So we need to have that sense of professional equal business stature. Hope that makes sense. Absolutely. And from that leadership perspective, from that sales leader, leadership perspective, uh, what are your thoughts with regards to, uh, to sales leadership today really on um, cultivating a culture of equal business stature, of, um, of nurturing, nurturingly asserti- asserting ourselves in, in a process in order to get to the truth? I, I think they're trying to. I mean, you know, I, I, I don't think this gap is unrecognizable. Um, I think that, you know, a lot of leaders are attempting to do so. I think that also that that's not an easy path. That's, that's on that soft skill side. You know, how do I build up somebody's confidence in order to do this? And, and most everybody wants to gravitate towards what can I fix? What techniques can I use? Instead of looking at that, you know, that position, that attitude, that makeup of, of the seller and their organization. Well, you just teed it off for us. Let's talk about techniques. Let's talk about the techniques that sellers could use in order to really kind of start to build. So, you know, let's break it down, maybe really kind of relationship, qualifying, and then closing. If I were to ask you, if you could share a couple of techniques or one technique on each of those, what would you, what would you share? What is your number one technique when it comes to uh, really establishing equal business stature? I, I think it's, it's, you know, one of the techniques is just preparing ahead of time. Mm. Um, I, I, there's a, I, I get a prevailing attitude from a lot of salespeople that look, er, every, er, every customer is special. Every customer is different. And I understand that they are, but therefore my process has to be wide open and I just need to go with the flow when I go in. Well, that's not the case at all. I think that if a little bit of preparation on how the meeting is going to go, the questions that we're going to ask as salespeople, the, the agenda that we bring, the decisions that are going to be made at that meeting, if we just take 5, 10, 15 minutes and prep on how the meeting goes, then we're showing up with a plan. And you know our rule. Um, you, know, you either have a plan or you're part of someone else's. And the, the other thing is, as salespeople, we've run this meeting hundreds and hundreds of times. So we should, we should be paying attention to the common questions that we get, the common things that people are going to bring up and, and bring them up a, ahead of time. I mean, it's, it's just that sense of if we just did that consistently, just think of the message that we would send. Yeah, well, I've got something I sometimes say, and, and I mean, I hope I can get away with it here. A lot of people say, well, my, my, you know, the sales leaders say, geez, my people don't prepare. And well, why don't they prepare? Well, they think that because every customer is different and every customer is unique, 
they got to really just go in there and go with the flow and just figure out. And, and they don't really need a process because everyone's different. So, well, you know, in our world, it's the reading of process because, because everyone's different. Mm -hmm. and, and, and at the end of the, go ahead. Oh, no, no, no. Go ahead. I, I think you're, so it, just a story about that. Like before I engaged with Sandler, my preparation was, oh my goodness, you know, my, my, my prospect can ask me so many different questions. And, and I would prepare with documentation, with spec sheets, with, you know, with flyers, with, with, you know, brochures and access to PDFs. And this is 20 years ago, right? So, and, and if you can imagine me like pulling a wagon in, I mean, that was basically my preparation, but it never occurred to me that I could prepare questions that would take the meeting in the direction that would serve both of us. And, and when I started preparing, this is funny. I, I, um, <clears throat> I, I always took my meeting plan with me and sometimes it was four pages. Sometimes it was six pages. And when I would sit down in front of a leader an executive or my prospect, I would say, I made some notes. I did some preparation for the meeting. I hope you don't mind me referring to them. I would always get the leader would look over at my notes and say, can I have a copy of that? I'm like, well, sure. Yeah. You know, here, the way the meeting was going to go, all the pressure was off and the meeting went exactly the way we yep. wanted it so yeah ab absolutely that pre-call planner is crucial and for anyone listening here i mean i can give you a few i think uh, uh joe will uh will agree one who are you meeting why are you meeting them who are you meeting map them out are you connected on linkedin to them what is their disc style um are they close to you are they an enemy are they neutral are they a friend is there anything you're worried about um what questions are you uh, worried that they're going to ask you what is your response to those questions? Um, what questions or what verses would you use on those questions? Uh, what are you planning on figuring out? What's important for you to uncover? Prepare those questions ahead of time. Um, if you have any biggest fears, anything you're worried about, surface that early on at the beginning and have that ready. Um, if it's a money conversation, if it's a uh, decision, a complex decision uh, conversation, if there's anything that's, that, that a sales professional is worried about, that's a place to prepare on it, have it ready and talk about it at the beginning and just, just use the biggest fear. Um, what is the upfront contract going to sound like? And of course, what is the outcome of the meeting and, and what are you expecting to happen at the end? Because, and if you take a few moments, if salespeople just took a few moments to do this, their lives, all the pressure would go away. I, in my opinion, life's too short to do it any other way. And when, when sales leaders tell me that they feel that there's not happening, I, I ask them, is it because your salespeople either, you know, it's, and I, and this is, Dead honest here, I say, look, they usually salespeople don't do this. They don't prepare eyes because they're, they're, they're stupid, lazy, don't know or don't care. It's either one of those. Mm -hmm. And, and again, pressured, busy, you know, it, it's it, the world's coming at. I don't want to change. I've gotten this far. I'm meeting my goals or coming close to it. I don't want to upset the apple cart. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of emotion going in there as well. Oh, yeah. yeah. And you said it at the beginning. It's easy to get in sales. It's hard to keep the job. It is. It's I love it. Mm -hmm. So, um, Joe, my question to you is, what is your secret sauce for selling? Oh, uh, I, I would say I've always connected well with folks. And uh, this is going to sound like a, um, what, when I first joined Sandler, I had the pleasure of meeting Ed Staub. And Ed Staub, Sandler trainer in Pennsylvania in the United States, was hyper-focused on professional relationships, hyper-focused mm -hmm. on asking the right questions, hyper-focused on making sure we're, we're presenting ourselves in a way that somebody would say, that's a professional, Joe's a professional, I'm going to listen to what he says. And as a result of listening to Ed, my proposals, and I was selling information, you know, IT services, pretty much a commodity market, my proposals were often would approach twice the price of my closest competitor, and I was getting the deals. Now, there was a reason, because I could build the relationship, I was uncovering more of the project and a lot of the what-ifs uh, in a time when there was a, hey, let's start the project and then uh, do cost overruns and change orders as we went along, whereas I was doing it all up front, and people like that predictability. But I couldn't have done that unless I had that relationship. I couldn't have done that unless I gained that trust quickly. So that's my secret sauce of selling. Wow. Yeah. Um, act the part. Mm -hmm. Act the part. <laughs> it is. Yeah. And, and, and my favorite sound of rule, you, you know, sales is a Broadway play performed by a psychiatrist. 
Act the part. Mm -hmm. Act the part. 100%. I love it. All right. Perfect. Joe, thank you so much. Before we go, um, is there anything you're reading, uh, a book, a podcast you're listening to, maybe even a movie, anything that you'd like to share with the listeners and viewers uh, just to give them uh, an edge on, on selling and leadership? You know, it's one of the books that I'm coming in, and this is this is going to sound. Uh, uh, our 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 own Mike Crandall wrote a book on motivating uh, motivational management, and I when I'm with a lot of leaders, I keep coming back to that book and those you know understand the motivations of your people, understand what's going on. There are five basic motivations that anybody has. We all assume salespeople are coin operated, but we can get to that quota by. Uh, understanding some of their other motivators. So it's a small book. It's a short book. It's, it's put out by Sandler. I would, I would highly recommend it. Yep. Mike's awesome. We're having him on the show. And, and that is an awesome book. I appreciate you sharing. Yeah. Joe, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Um, and I look forward to seeing you soon again. And uh, all I can say is uh, good selling to you. Oh, thanks. Good selling to you, James. Thank you for having me. All right. Thanks, guys. Um, listeners, viewers out there, no guts, no gain. Don't worry, just do your thing and uh, build your relationships. And don't forget, sales is a force for good. Make sure you're on the right side of the line.